Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at THE Final Destination, which is a fancy way of saying Final Destination 4 and or Final Destination 3D. Yep, this is the much maligned 3D extravaganza that came out in 2009, the same year as Saw 3D. Perhaps it's not a coincidence, then, that I fucking hate both these movies. Also, heads up, I'm recording this after I got back from SummerSlam, and my voice is still kinda shot. Sorry, but that's bound to happen after you witness Seth Rollins frog splash Brock Lesnar through an announcer's table. And your eyes don't deceive you. That is, in fact, Chelsea and me back there fist pumping our brains out. By God. Final Four, which I'll call it to save time, has a lot of the same problems as its pink-blooded Saw brethren. Primarily the fact that all of its characters are walking, talking, gaping assholes that'll afflict any viewer with a serious case of misanthropy. Characters have never been Final Destination's focus, but as the movies carried on, the side characters evolved from being boring and forgettable to obnoxious and cynical, with everyone either a snarky douchebag or a walking hard-on. Final Four is the culmination of that evolution, and while some people argue that this is intentional because watching shitty characters die is enjoyable, that only gives us a few bloody moments of satisfaction. The other 80-whatever minutes, we've just gotta sit there and deal with their bullshit. Once again, James Wong and Glenn Morgan, who made the first and third movies, were swapped out with writer Eric Brass and director David R. Ellis, who made the second movie. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Perennial producer Craig Perry also returned, always a champion of increasing the gore, but unfortunately for Final Four, the graphic kills, which have always been the sole strength and indeed raison d'etre of the franchise, are really unsatisfying. Everything looks way too cartoonish and fake, and I get that this movie's going for a more darkly comedic tone, but make me laugh at jokes or circumstances, not your shitty digital effects. How many people will die as this series hits rock bottom? Let's find out and get to the kills of THE Final Destination, stupid. The movie begins with a pretty cool song by Shinedown. Awesome, I'm fucking pumped. Too bad this movie's about to shit the bed hard. This not NASCAR race at McKinley Speedway is being watched by our soon-to-be prognosticator, Nick, played by Bobby Campo, who would go on to be that affair having teacher in the Scream TV series. Which, yes, I've seen and I enjoy, and I hope to one day cover it somehow. He's here with more model cutout characters, like his girlfriend Lori, her friend Janet, and this hunt dude, who's here actively rooting for the drivers to crash and die. And you're gonna have to scrape off the fence with a shovel. A shovel! Wow, hon, you're so fucking cool. Our future deja vu moments to herald the upcoming disaster include a binoculars flask the kids share with a nearby couple, some signs that this building is in need of repairs, an obfuscational cowboy who's a gentleman enough to move for the sake of their sight lines, and Emmanuel over there putting tampons in her kids' ears for sound protection. Because, yeah, a real person would totally do that. We also briefly see other future fugitives of death, including a mechanic there with his girlfriend, and a super unsubtle racist dude who whistles Dixie tunes at George, a black security guard. This movie's disaster kicks off with death's go-to spell, Gust of Wind. He must be a huge Fletch Stormtail fan. It's wind all the fucking time with this guy. Like what, your wind can unscrew bolts now? That's some OP wind death. A premature pit stop exit leaves a metal doohickey in the road, and that causes a disaster that starts killing people with effects that could have been done by any 7th grader with an Adobe subscription. The deaths come via crushing, torso cutting, and Looney Tunes sound effects. They also come via 3D wood shards, whoa! We see a ton of nameless cartoon characters killed in various ways before Hunt and Janet are cartoonishly crushed by a chunk of ceiling. Then, even more nameless cartoons suffer the same cartoonish fate. It's weird to me that this looks so bad because they're just using the same technique they did in part two, combining green screen shots with some digital additions. I don't know if it's the lighting or the parameters of their keying effect or what, but for some reason, everything looks real fake. Which is a damn shame, seeing as how they filmed a bunch of cool practical stuff at the Mobile International Speedway in Irvington, Alabama. <laughs> like, they had an actual car on actual fire slide down a green screen track into a pillar and a dummy. But in the actual movie, that shot doesn't feel so real. Part of me doesn't understand why they shot anything with dummies. <laughs> like when they slingshotted a 40-pound engine into one. Since in the movie, it all ends up looking digital. This premonitious disaster ends after 
Nick watches Lori and George get consumed by a fiery explosion that also blows him back and impales him. Whoa! whoa, whoa secret red in a racetrack! Nick gets one look at the binocular booze, the stylish cowboy, and those tampon earplugs, and he knows they've got to get the fuck out of there. His rush to leave causes, as always, a fight to break out. And, as always, a bunch of people get caught up in it and eject themselves from the situation, with the racist dude Carter telling his wife to stay in her seat. And yeah, they named another character in this series Carter. No, I don't know why, since we all know there's only one thing you think of when you hear that name in a Final Destination movie. Carter, you did it! The characters yell at each other outside until they hear the crash taking place inside and see some awful looking fiery chaos. Are you shitting me? Just the whole reason I come for these stupid redneck things. Dude, it looks like the stage show for Nero's flute concert back there. What the fuck's the matter with you? Anyway, most of what we saw in that vision is taking place right now. You know, minus the main characters dying. And a news report later literally spells out that 52 people died in the catastrophe. So we'll count 51 deaths right here with a big old thanks to Action 7 for doing my job for me. And I took one off because while the racist dude Carter argues with security guard George about going back inside for his wife, the mechanic's wife, Nadia, gets killed by a wayward tire flying through the air. I'm assuming that news report counted her among the 52. The effect when it first happens is pretty bad, but I will give credit to the practical corpse they show afterwards. Then we get a title card, and the most badass opening credits I've ever seen. In them, a dope-ass hard rock theme plays over x-ray depictions of the kills we've seen happen in the series. It's all very stylized and does a great job getting the viewer excited, since it reminds them of the best thing these movies have always had going for them, the gory graphic kill. But after that, we're back to the kill-free parts of the movie, which is never much fun in this series, because we gotta sit here listening to shitbag characters like Hunt. It's your choice, heads or tails, but you know I like head. A memorial is held for the accident victims, and while Nick and Lori are there, they run into the tampon mom, Samantha, and her husband. Samantha is played by Krista Allen, who, I've gotta say, is trying her damnedest in this role. She's come a long way from getting ogled at by Jim Carrey in an elevator. Mama! They thank Nick for saving their family with first draft generic dialogue while bland, sappy music plays in the background. Take care. Thank you. This movie had a new composer after the woman who wrote the music for the first three films, Shirley Walker, sadly died of a stroke in 2006. At the time of her death, she had apparently scored more major motion pictures than any other American woman. And her work included James Wong and Glenn Morgan's other horror projects like Willard and the Black Christmas remake. Even the first film she worked on was horror, 1984's Ghoulies, which she co-composed with Richard Band. Rest in peace, Shirley. At the memorial, Nick and Lori also formally meet George, who's played by master shrimper Michael T. Williamson, previously seen on The Kill Count as Joe Dixon in Purge Election Year, where I somehow forgot to point him out. Dude was Benjamin Buford Blue, how could I miss that? Before George can tell the kids all the ways you can serve shrimp, racist Carter walks up and blames George for his wife's death. I wanted to go in there after, but... He spits a hard n-word at George and threatens him as he leaves. Later that night, Nick has visions in a dream, which are honestly just embarrassing. I feel like these are clues in an old mist game. Should you get the red pages, Nick, or the blue ones? Nick doesn't know it yet, but that shitty vision was foreshadowing drunk-ass racist Carter driving a tow truck to George's house, where the security guard is shockingly shading in his character by reading from an AA book. Oh, and there's a picture with a lady in the back there too? Wow, it's like he's a real person. Nice. But racist Carter doesn't see George as a person, and after the guard's lights go down, he gets straight to work putting up a cross to burn in George's front yard. Death also gets straight to work and knocks a bunch of stuff over until Carter's truck is driving on its own and playing War's Why Can't We Be Friends loudly through its speakers. Which does, admittedly, make for some pretty funny music backing as racist Carter gets caught by the truck's hook and dragged down the street. Between sparks and gas, a fire gets going, and racist Carter is killed in what ends up being an outright comedy scene. 
That feels straight out of Scary Movie, complete with the explosion that produces a severed burning head. Props to actor Justin Wellborn, who did a partial burn stunt and was actually dragged down the street under the supervision of stunt coordinator Jeffrey J. Dashnock. And double props to stunt performer Steve Davison, who did a full body burn while being dragged down the street. You know how I love a good fire stunt. Now put that guy out, you crazy kids. As though racist Carter's death wasn't enough of a self-parody already, when news of his death is on TV the next day, we get a scene that's literally in the satirical horror comedy Cabin in the Woods, with a red-headed heroine standing around in her underwear solely for the sake of the camera. This movie is so bad and dumb that it's inadvertently a template for parodies. Nick has another crappy-looking vision that brings him images of scissors and cigarettes, an alt-rock album title if I've ever heard one, and he tells Lori that he thinks his dream from the previous night foretold him of the flaming tow truck incident. And now that racist guy is dead. Haha, <laughs> yep, he is. Samantha and her kids are still alive, but she's now in danger according to Nick's PlayStation 1 cutscenes. She sends her little monsters to an arcade with some money, then goes to get her hairs cut at a beauty salon. Ooh, and a petty. Damn, Sam, you treating yourself, huh? The salon's various tools and accessories conspire to create a slippery floor and a hairspray bottle bomb, but those end up being red herrings. Although her kids eat shit and the bomb goes off, the ceiling fan it dislodges doesn't fall on Samantha. Instead, she's killed after a line of blunt foreshadowing. I've got my eye on you two. When a stone hit by a lawnmower across the street goes straight through her eye. And if you're wondering why Samantha gets killed, but not her husband or kids, I guess maybe they would have escaped the disaster either way. Whereas Sam was left behind getting trampled by the crowds before that engine fell on her. News of Samantha's death makes it into the paper, but it doesn't seem to phase the horny hunt. We just lost a really hot milf. Hey, does that guy like sex and stuff? I haven't been able to tell. Nick and Lori tell Hunt and Janet about the visions he's been having, as well as the history they've learned about similar past incidents like Flight 180, and how after all of those disasters, the survivors subsequently died. Well, we survived. So now does that mean we all die? Yes, that's exactly what that means. We're four movies in here, you know this, man! Nick also shares the tried and true theory that another person's intervention will cause death to skip a kill. But this is all too much for Janet, and she leaves all freaked out. As for Hunt, he resigns himself to the possibility that maybe they're right, but he intends to carry on as per usual. So I'm gonna do what I do best. I'm gonna go get laid. Wow, Hunt, you're so fucking cool, dude. Nick unlocks another level in a free online flash game, and that inspires him to go back to the racetrack and try to jog his memory of the order in which people died. He thinks back to all the deaths he saw in his premonition, but he can't remember who died after Samantha. Nick and Lori are then discovered by George, who responds to their theory sounding like George friggin' Washington. Young man, that sounds crazy. They watch the security cam footage that shows how dying is easy, young man, and Nick sees enough to figure out death's order. Looks like the mechanic is next. Hey, maybe if we can stop this mechanic from getting killed, we can break the chain and the rest of us will all be safe. <laughs> yeah, dude, that'll definitely happen. It works every time. They track down the mechanic, a guy named Andy, and visit him at the garage in which he works, which is a dangerous place indeed. Andy's been having a hard time ever since seeing his wife get squashed by a tire, and turns out George can relate to him since he recently lost his wife and daughter in a car accident he caused while drunk driving. George continues to develop his character while the others just kind of nod at him a bunch, not knowing that inside the garage, death is getting back to work again. When it finally springs its trap, a gas tank is launched that catches Andy in the chest and sends him flying partially through a metal fence. This is another kill where I don't know why it looks so bad, since on set they had a dummy with a pre-cut back that they pumped full of blood tubes and actually rammed through a fence. What the hell happened here? Moving down death's list, Nick says that Hunt and Janet died at the same time in his premonition, so he splits with Lori and George in an effort to track down both of them. Hunt is, predictably, doing the only thing he claims to be good at, even though he taps out after finishing himself and leaves his lady partner unfulfilled. Oh, and look, he's already getting excited to disappoint another girl. But Hunt had better get away from that pool, because Nick is seeing ominous signs and more shitty visions, warning him that water bad. Fire good? Oh, and yeah, check out that not-so-subtle Easter egg referencing Allie Larder's character from parts one and two. Her name was Clear Rivers, not Claire. I was never saying it wrong, she just had a dumb name. Hunt gets into a fight with a little kid who gives two of the funniest no's I've ever heard in my life. 
Give me the gun. No! Give me the fucking gun. No! After confiscating the gun by force, Hunt discards it in a way that ends up turning on the pool pump, which recently must have gotten turbocharged or some shit, cause look at that thing. That's some overkill. Meanwhile, Janet the personality list is also putting herself in water's way by getting an automatic car wash, a fact she mentions to Lori on the phone. She loses reception before Lori can warn her about the dangers of Agua, but it's already too late. A mechanical failure caused by a wayward car antenna stops Janet's car in its tracks, right in the middle of those fun spinny washer things. Janet's sunroof opens and a big pipe burst, sending her screaming towards a prestigious death. When Hunt's lucky coin rolls its way into the pool, he dives in after it, only to get caught by the super pool pump pulling at his bum. My bum is on the drain. My bum is on the drain. The pressure keeps building and it's causing lots of pain. So now, he and Janet are in simultaneous situations of aquatic danger, with Janet's getting extra sudsy. But lucky for her, Lori and George drop drive into the car wash and save her from getting her face cleaned off. Their intervention saves her life, and she's rescued from water and pipe alike. But unfortunately for Hunt, Nick's unable to find him when he finally gets to the golf club pool. Hunt is killed when the pool pump reaches maximum pressure and sucks out his insides, which splash up into the screen, whoa, and land on the deck in a bloody mess. This nasty kill required actor Nick Zeno to get some underwater training, and the scene took three days to shoot. He'd have to stay down there while they got different shots, and in between takes, breathe through instruments like these hoses. Not too hard to act like you're drowning when that's going on. You gotta get in that headspace of death. Like, I'm dying, but then I'm underwater and I'm tied to the bottom of the pool. And then you start losing your cool. It becomes very real, very fast. Oh, also, the digital blood in this scene apparently has an excuse. They were shooting at a public pool and couldn't contaminate the water with any fake blood. So they say, at least. Since they successfully intervened to save Janet's life, the survivors figure that death is either done with them completely, or it'll skip her and move on to George. Either way, George ain't worried. Heather, I'm at then... peace with it, and um, my family's waiting for me. I'm ready to go. And so that night, George decides to end his own life. Nick and Lori come over to check on him and find him hanging from the ceiling. But hey, he's not dead yet. Although, turns out, not for lack of trying. I've been trying to kill myself all day. Since George has been unable to kill himself, they think that means death really has given up on them entirely. Awesome. Let's pop some 3D champagne corks. Whoa. To life. What do y'all got planned for it? Lots of <laughs> traveling, like Paris, maybe some beaches, Saint-Tropez. Saint-Tropez? What? Aren't you college students? Where's all this globetrotting money coming from? Sam and Lori may have been premature with their travel plans anyway, since all of a sudden, Nick has another vision that includes some water dripping and a 3D snake. Hiss. I mean, whoa. A news report reveals that there was another survivor from the racetrack they didn't know about. That tall cowboy, a guy named Jonathan Groves. He was rescued in the rubble, which is not the same fate we saw him suffer in the premonition. But if I would've asked him to move like I did in the premonition, he would've died. Instead, he survived. That means Jonathan Groves must be the next one on Death's list, which is why Nick and George rush to the hospital where he's being taken care of. Also residing in the very same hospital is a racist old man. You know how many of your kind I killed in Korea? So fun watching assholes all the time. The old dude's tub starts to overfill with water after the nurses leave him alone. And it looks like his room must be right above the cowboys, because now there's a waterfall coming down on his head. Jonathan Groves actually manages to get out of his bed and crawl across the room, but by time Nick and George find him, it's too late. The tub falls through the floor and crushes him. I'm not entirely sure if it makes sense for the tub to be there, when the leaks began right over Jonathan's bed all the way on the other side of the room. But my editor Zorin says it makes sense for some reason, so I don't feel comfortable berating it as stupid. Maybe I'm just the stupid one, who knows? Lori and Janet, the two most useless and underwritten characters in this whole damn series, are at the mall to see a movie, so that's where Nick and George head next while George tells Nick a bit about his late wife. It's like deja vu. My wife said that deja vu is like God's way. Whoa, okay, we're doing that kill again. Damn. I mean, I knew the dude had to die, but now we're down to exactly zero interesting characters. Bummer. While Lori and Janet make their way to the theater, we see a lot of construction going on outside and within the mall, giving us lots of dangerous details that these characters should be looking out for. You know, maybe they could stay safe if their parents had taught them to fear and respect the escalator. But I guess they didn't, since Lori's shoelace gets caught. Thankfully, 
Eventually, it snaps off before a bloodbath can ensue, leaving the girls safe for now. Nick arrives at the mall and has another vision that shows the girls being killed when their theater blows up into a fireball. Sure enough, death's already gusting winds about and soaking sawdust in flammable chemicals in a room under construction that's right behind the screen in Lori and Janet's theater. They're there to see the latest shitty 3D movie, Love Lays Die. But Nick has a hard time finding which theater they're in, since apparently this thing's having an endgame sized opening. He eventually manages to track them down, and he gets Lori to leave with him before the fire that's broken out backstage can spread to some barrels that are spontaneously combustible. I'm sorry, what? You mean they're combustible, right? Because spontaneously combustible would mean they're apt to blow up at literally any time. <laughs> you really think there would be spontaneously combustible barrels lying around a construction site movie? Cause that's just fucking stupid. Anyway, Janet refuses to budge, so when that barrel spontaneously combusts, she's killed alongside all the other theater patrons, who are not only blown up, but also stabbed and stuff. We get some variety here. Props to the stunt performers being flung around on cables, and props to the crew who actually blew up a theater facade for real. Movie making is fun! The fire continues to spread and causes one, two, three more big explosions in the mall, and as, wait, sorry, four more big explosions in the mall. The last one tears apart the escalator, which finally gives us the bloodbath that was promised when Lori is pulled into its exposed gears and squeezed like a bottle of toothpaste. Great use of some soft fake legs made by makeup artist Mike McCarty of K&B. It's an awesome and graphic kill. Oh shit, kills? Have I been forgetting to count kills this whole time? I have, probably because those all took place inside a secret eyeball mall, whoa! My wife said that deja vu is like God's way. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, that was all another premonition. But unfortunately, Nick's unable to save George from his ambulance death the second time around. It happens off screen in reality here, but we did see it take place during the vision. So when it comes to the awards, I'm gonna have to factor that in. Nick races off to the mall in order to stop the deadly explosion, and he's able to find the construction site fire before it's reached critical spontaneous combustion levels. Although he puts out the initial fire, death, uh, finds a way, and ends up shooting off a nail gun, which pins Nick to the wall and starts a stream of spontaneously flammable liquid that's headed straight towards a second fire. But Nick thinks fast and uses the world's longest tiki torch to set off the fire sprinklers in the room, which puts out the fire before the barrels can get hot enough to spontaneously explode. The 3D movie watchers in that theater don't even know how good they have it. And I'll tell you what, it's a lot better than us 3D movie watchers have it, cause we're stuck with this piece of shit. Two weeks later, the three survivors meet at their favorite coffee shop where they're laughing and having a good time. Hell, Nick's even known as a local hero. You saved a lot of lives, man. Thanks, random guy. But this happy ending doesn't stay happy for long since Nick starts getting a bad feeling about everything he sees, and not just the shitty acting. What do you think, babe? Hey, uh, space cadet, you wanna come back down to Earth? <laughs> The movie ends with another disaster that kills all three of them. But since it cuts to the end credits, they're shown in that cool x-ray style that was used in the opening credits. Not a bad way to do some stinger kills like that. Although, honestly, I'm just happy this thing is over. How many cartoonish kills were flung into our faces here? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Heads or tails? Nope. Sixty-one people died in THE final destination, and as per usual with this series, most of them, fifty-one in fact, were of indeterminable gender. The others were four women and six men, giving us this mostly grey pie chart, and with a runtime of only 82 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 1.34 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Hunt. He's one of my least favorite characters of all time, but man did he die well. This death is unique and splashtastically gory, of course, but it also gets points for the psychological horror going on here. He's surrounded by other people in the pool who he can't contact and who don't know he's in trouble. That's some scary shit, man. Dull machete for lamest kill will go to Jonathan Groves, crushed by a bathtub that maybe shouldn't have been there logically. And in the Final Destination series, I'm giving out the Primo Premonition Award for the coolest kill seen only in a vision. This time it'll go to Lori's death during the second premonition, when she was caught in the escalator gears and turned into human go -Gurt. This was also the film's late director David Ellis' favorite kill. Um, 
It's gross. Yes, it is, David. Yes, it is. And that's it. The Final Destination came out in 2009 in glorious 3D and is definitely one of my least favorite films I've covered on the Kill Count. Thankfully, the fifth film is actually pretty good. I'll show you next week. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I'd like to thank some patrons like Nicholas Beauchamp, Alex Green, Danielle Colwell, Aiden Galloway, Taylor, and Ayeli. Hopefully my voice wasn't too grating during this. It actually hurt me a lot to film this, but I had to get it done. Schedules are a thing. 3D, whoa. I just had to film some time, sorry. Thanks everyone, be good people.